Daja Hao. Welcome everyone to the second part of today's webinar. I'm Stuart and I'm one of the application scientists at Edinburgh Instruments. In the second half, I'm going to be explaining how you can disentangle fluorescence and phosphorescence using the FLS 1000 photoluminescence spectrometer. A brief outline of my talk. I'm going to start off explaining the different types of photoluminescence and the time scales they occur in. I'm going to then move on to the three photon counting modes in the FLS 1000, TCSPC, MCS, and Kinetic, and explain what types of photoluminescence and what time scales they should be used in. I'm going to then move on to a section on how you can gate the photomultiplier detector and the advantages this has for separating fluorescence from phosphorescence. And finally, I'm going to end with an application example, the characterization of TADF emitters, which involves a combination of all these previous techniques put into practice. That brings me to the first section of the webinar, which is types of photoluminescence and their timescales. I'm sure many people there in the audience are already very familiar with photoluminescence. But for those of you who are new, photoluminescence refers to the emission of light from a material after it has absorbed light. This could be in a molecular system where absorption of a photon promotes the molecule from its ground singlet state into a singlet excited state and then radiative relaxation from these excited states back to the ground state where is photoluminescence with the emission of photons. Photoluminescence also commonly occurs in semiconducting materials where absorption of a photon promotes the semiconductor an electron from the valence band to the conduction band and the radiative relaxation back to the valence band results in the emission of a photon, and this is also photoluminescence. In molecular systems that have distinct uh, singlet and triplet levels, marked T and S on this diagram, you can further subdivide photoluminescence uh, into fluorescence and phosphorescence, depending on the origin uh, of the state that the light comes from. So the ground states of nearly all molecules are a singlet state. And when the photon is absorbed, the molecule is promoted to a singlet excited state due to conservation of angular momentum. And radiative relaxation from this singlet excited state back to the singlet ground state is called fluorescence. And this has a lifetime of about 10 picoseconds to 100 nanoseconds. Alternatively, after the molecule has been excited uh, to the S1 state, it may undergo an inter-system crossing to the T1 triplet state. And then a radiate of relaxation from the triplet state to the ground state results in phosphorescence. And phosphorescence occurs on a longer time scale typically having a lifetime on the one microseconds to 10 seconds region. And this is because it's a, a forbidden transition because you're breaking conservation of angular momentum with this transition. And so phosphorescence occurs on a longer time scale. It's a slower transition. Just a word on what I mean here by lifetime, for those of you who are not familiar with fluorescence and phosphorescence lifetimes, the lifetime here refers to the time it takes for a population with intensity I, I naught to fall to, to I naught over E. So the fluorescence or phosphorescence decay starts off with an initial intensity and then it falls to that intensity over E, and the time it takes for it to do that is the lifetime. 
And that's what these values here refer to. It's the time it takes to fall to this uh, one over E value. Fluorescence and phosphorescence are the most uh, common processes that occur in molecules, but uh, a phenomena called delayed fluorescence can also occur. Uh, there are two main types of delayed fluorescence. Uh, on the left here is E-type delayed fluorescence, which is more commonly known now as thermally activated delayed fluorescence, particularly in the OLED research community. So the idea of delayed fluorescence uh, is that the molecule is promoted from its singlet ground state to the singlet excited state, and then undergoes an intersystem crossing to the triplet state, and then a thermally uh, assisted reverse intersystem crossing back to the singlet state. And then the singlet state can radiatively relax, result in the emission of a photon, and that is delayed fluorescence. The other type of delayed fluorescence is known as P-type delayed fluorescence or triplet-triplet annihilation. So this requires at least two molecules. It's a bimolecular process. And how this works is that, again, the molecules are excited to their single excited state. They undergo an inter-system crossing to the triplet but there's then an interaction between the triplet state of one molecule and the triplet state of another, and they undergo triplet-triplet annihilation. During this process, the, the triplet of one of the molecules is de-excited back down to the singlet ground state, and the triplet of the, the other molecule is excited to its singlet excited state. And then this a state can radiatively relax, resulting in delayed fluorescence. Delayed fluorescence tends to occur on a time scale somewhere between fluorescence and phosphorescence, uh, with typical lifetimes of 100 nanoseconds to one millisecond. The last type of photoluminescence that I'm going to discuss is persistent luminescence which is also commonly called afterglow. So this occurs on a much longer time scale than the, the previous ones. And the idea here is that the process involves some kind of trap. So these could be trapping centers located below the conduction band or above the valence band. And electrons in these trapping centers are released uh, usually in some form of thermally activated process. They then migrate towards luminescence centers where they can uh, radiatively recombine, resulting in the emission of light, which is persistent luminescence. This detrapping process is very slow or can be very slow. And so persistent luminescence has much longer lifetimes typically in the order of seconds to hours or even days uh, due to the slow detrapping uh, process. So I've explained the four main types of photoluminescence that are encountered. And the thing to note is that these cover a very wide time range. We have 10 picoseconds lifetimes being about the shortest fluorescence lifetime. And then for persistent luminescence phosphors, they can have lifetimes on the hundreds of hours. And so to be able to characterize these materials, we need to be able to measure the emission of photons over a very wide range of times. And you require a spectrometer that has a combination of different measurement techniques to cover this entire time range. The FLS 1000 has three single photon counting modes that cover a full 15 decades of time range. For the fastest lifetimes, there's time correlated single photon counting, or TCSPC for short. 
for the intermediate, we have multi-channel scaling mode or MCS. And for the longest times, we have kinetic mode. And I'm now going to explain each of these measurement modes in, different, uh, in more detail and explain the types of photoluminescence transitions. They're suitable for measuring and the advantages and disadvantages of each. I'll start with the, the most famous one, which is time correlated single photon counting or TCSPC. The idea of TCSPC is shown in this uh, schematic at the bottom, and it's quite a simple idea. You have a, a pulsed laser, uh, typically with a, a high repetition rate in the megahertz range. And when this laser fires, it sends an electronic trigger pulse that starts the, the clock of the counting electronics. The laser excites the sample and the sample emits a photon of photoluminescence, which is detected using a PMT detector, which converts that to an electrical pulse and this electrical pulse stops the clock. And the basic idea of TCSPC is that you want to measure the time between the excitation pulse and the detection of this photon. And then you record that time on a histogram that's stored in the memory of the spectrometer. And one of the key principles of TCSPC is that only a single photon can be detected during, for each flash of the laser. So you then repeat this process by firing the laser again, and you record a different time and plot it in the histogram, and then repeat this process millions of times to build up the complete photoluminescence decay of your sample photon by photon. TCSPC is the method of choice for measuring fast photoluminescence lifetimes, typically on a nanoseconds to picosecond time range, due to its very high time resolution. The ele timing electronics of the FLS 1000 has a, a resolution down to 305 femtoseconds. An example of TCSPC in use uh, is shown here. So this was a decay of an organic molecule, 9 amino acridine, uh, which shows a nice mono exponential uh, fluorescence decay with a lifetime of 16 nanoseconds. The TCSPC technique can be also be used to measure photoluminescence decays from semiconductor samples, such as perovskites. So here you can see that the photoluminescence decay of the perovskite has a very non-exponential behavior, and it was fit with a stretched exponential model, which returned an average lifetime of 36 nanoseconds. And TCSPC is ideal for characterizing both of these materials. As I said, TCSPC has a, a very high time resolution, and that allows it to measure lifetimes down to five picoseconds in the FLS 1000. An example of this is shown here, which is the, the measurement of an organic molecule known as 4-DASPE, which is a very short fluorescence lifetime. On the left is 4-DASPE when dissolved in ethanol, which was found to have a lifetime of about 57 picoseconds. But when 4-DASPE is uh, dissolved in water, uh, its lifetime shortens and was found to have a lifetime of 11 picoseconds. So this demonstrates the ability of TCSPC mode to measure extremely short uh, fluorescence lifetimes uh, down to five picoseconds. So 
TCSPC is the technique of choice for measuring short fluorescence lifetimes. The downside of the technique is that it becomes inefficient and slow for measuring longer lifetimes. And the main reason for this is because of this requirement that only a single photon can be detected per excitation period, so per flash of the laser. And TCSPC therefore relies upon high frequency, so a high repetition rate lasers for fast measurements. So when you have short lifetimes, you can set your laser to a very fast repetition rate in the megahertz range, and you can therefore measure many photons very rapidly, and the technique is efficient. But when you're measuring materials with much longer lifetimes, you've got to reduce the repetition rate of the laser and the technique becomes very slow because most of the time the spectrometer spends measuring no photons at all. It's waiting on photons to arrive. The solution to this is to use a complementary measurement mode in the FLS 1000, which is called multi-channel scaling, single photon counting or MCS mode for short. The basic layout of MCS mode is quite similar to TCSPC. We've got some counting electronics, a laser and a sample and a detector. But the difference here is that this time the timing electronics trigger the laser rather than vice versa, as in the case of TCSPC. So the timing electronics send a trigger to the laser, tell it to fire. The laser fires and excites the sample. The sample emits multiple photons, which are detected by the detector and converted into electrical pulses which are then recorded using the timing electronics. And how this works is that the timing electronics has a, a time gate and any photons that arrive within this time gate are counted and the number of photons that arrive within the gate are added to the histogram stored in memory. The time gate is then moved to the next position in time in order to see the photons that arrive later and the photons in the next region are counted and added to the histogram and so on and the, the time gate is swept through the entire time range and this builds up uh, the complete photoluminescence decay uh, in a single shot. However, the number of photons here is typically very small and in order to increase the signal to noise you will then repeat this process many times uh, so again flashing the laser uh, thousands or tens of thousands of times to build up a high signal to noise photoluminescence decay but the key thing is that multiple photons are detected during each flash of the laser. MCS mode is ideal for measuring longer lifetimes where TCSPC would be too slow, such as delayed fluorescence and phosphorescence. An example here is shown on the left, which is the phosphorescence decay of a europium complex measured using MCS mode which revealed a lifetime of about 120 microseconds. So MCS mode is the faster of the two techniques, but the downside is that it has a much lower time resolution. So MCS has a 10 nanosecond time resolution, where TCSPC has a 305 femtoseconds. So TCSPC is the method of choice for measuring fast fluorescence lifetimes, or lifetimes that contain very fast components where you require a high time resolution 
planned for delayed fluorescence and phosphorescence, where you want to just acquire your measurement quickly, then MCS mode uh, is the, the, the method of choice. Just a quick word on the excitation sources for these different measurement modes. So we have two different ranges of uh, lasers and LEDs uh, for TCSPC and MCS. So the first is the EPL and EPLED series. So these are picosecond pulsed uh, lasers or LEDs. The main advantage of these sources is they have very narrow pulse widths and they're ideal for measuring fluorescence or strong delayed fluorescence emission. And the EPL and EPLEDs can be operated in both TCSPC and MCS mode. The other light source we have is the variable pulse length laser or LED. So this source has a pulse output that is user adjustable. So the user can change it from about 100 nanoseconds long out to millisecond pulses or even CW mode. And this delivers much higher power to the sample. And the VPL and LED are therefore ideal for measuring weak delayed fluorescence and phosphorescence emission. And these lasers can be operated in MCS mode. The final measurement mode I want to talk about is single photon counting kinetic mode, which is used to measure the longest lifetimes. The idea of the experiment in kinetic mode is quite different to TCSPC and MCS. The, the excitation source for the sample is now a continuous wave source. So most commonly, this is the provided by the continuous xenon lamp of the FLS 1000, which is passed through the excitation monochromator to excite the sample with your chosen wavelength. And there's various types of kinetic mode measurements you can do. So one option is you can keep the sample constantly illuminated throughout the measurement. So this could be useful, for example, if you're looking at the degradation of your sample over time. You can monitor the change in photoluminescence intensity uh, as a function of exposure time uh, to the excitation light. Another option is that there's a computer controlled shutter and this shutter can be told to engage after a set amount of time. So you can excite your sample and charge it up for a certain length of time, then close the shutter and then monitor the photoluminescence decay after the excitation light has stopped. Kinetic mode is ideal for measuring very long lifetimes, such as persistent luminescence. So the example here uh, shown on the left is the persistent luminescence uh, from a, a phosphor measured using kinetic mode. The sample was exposed uh, to the excitation light for five minutes, which was set up uh, using the the fluidical software control of the shutter. You can set the shutter to always open, closed, or timed. So here it was set to five minutes. And then after five minutes, the shutter was closed and the persistent luminescence decays measured. And they were measured as a function of different excitation wavelengths to see what influence the excitation wavelength had on the decay profile. That's the end of the different measurement modes. The, the next section, I want to talk about how you can time gate the PMD detector and the FLS 1000 and what the advantages of this are.
In all the previous examples, when I showed decays, they were all occurring on roughly the same time scale. So we either had fluorescence decays, uh, delayed fluorescence on a, a microsecond, or phosphorescence on a millisecond time scale. However, it's quite common to have samples where you can have emission that occurs on very different time scales within the same sample. So the example shown here uh, on the left is a photoluminescence decay of terbium ions embedded in a fluorescence matrix measured using MCS mode. And what you can see is that there's a long phosphorescence decay from the terbium, but there's also this very sharp spike, which is the fluorescence emission uh, from the matrix. And on this time scale, the fluorescence is occurring effectively instantaneously after the laser flash, and which results in this spike. And this can cause problems for lifetime measurements because the number of photons per second that reach the PMT detector during this fluorescent spike is around 100 times higher than all the photons that are acquired during this, uh, that, that occur at the max of this phosphorescence tail. And this fluorescent spike can make it very difficult or slow to measure the phosphorescence. So the, the detectors used in a high intensity, a uh, high sensitivity spectrometer, such as the FLS 1000, are typically photomultiplier tubes. And because of the high sensitivity, there's a maximum number of photons per second that can reach the PMT before the PMT saturates, which means that we'll start to give nonlinear responses. Uh, I will start miscounting photons and eventually if exposed to too high, a light intensity can even be damaged. So when measuring any uh, photoluminescence lifetime, the number of photons per second must be kept lower than the saturation limit of the detector. And for a sample that just emits phosphorescence, you would have your maximum photons per second be at the, the start of your phosphorescence decay. And then you would use this to set your uh, emission bandwidths and attenuation and acquire your decay uh, based on how many photons per second are in the phosphorescence tail. However, when the sample contains fluorescence, it's now this fluorescence spike that determines the maximum number of photons hitting the detector. And to prevent the detector from saturating, you've got to keep this number low. And this can make it very difficult to measure the phosphorescence. Uh, or it takes much longer to acquire because there's less phosphorescence photons reaching the detector because you've had to narrow the emission bandwidth, for example. The solution to this problem is to time gate the PMT detector. So what is detector time gating? A gating circuit can be added to the PMT detector of the FLS 1000 to switch it off during this initial fluorescent spike and prevent the detector from saturating. The idea of detector time gating is that you have your excitation pulse. So this is typically from a laser, such as the VPL or the microsecond flash lamp. And when this excitation pulse excites the sample, the PMT is turned off. It's initially in an off state. After a specified delay, 
the game to the PMT is turned on. for the des a desired gate width, and then it's turned off again. And this means that the PMT is only detecting uh, photons during this gate. And either side of the gate, the PMT is switched off and can be exposed to very high photon levels without any risk of saturation or damage. And this switching mechanism uh, is the PMT gain switching is achieved by switching off the voltage to the dynodes in the PMT. So a PMT is made up of multiple dynodes, which are electron multipliers. And when the gating circuit is added, the voltage to these first dynodes is switched off, which stops the PMT from multiplying electrons and its gain is therefore switched off. Why is this useful? So if we go back to the photoluminescence decay of the terbium uh, sample with the fluorescence spike. So with no detector gating, the maximum photon intensity is limited by the fluorescent component for this measurement. So this measurement would take a long time because the maximum number of photons is controlled by the fluorescent spike. We can instead enable gating, which can be done through the fluidical software of the FLS 1000. So you can specify your gate delay and your gate width, and this switches the PMT off. So the, P the fluorescence spike is now removed because the delay was set to after the fluorescence has ended, and then the phosphorescence decay acquired while the, the PMT gain is on. So this allows you to measure phosphorescence decays quickly while being in the presence of a very intense fluorescence background. The other advantage of having a gated PMT is it allows you to separate fluorescence and phosphorescence components from the spectra. So this is the tame a terbium and fluorescent sample again. Uh, and this shows its emission spectrum uh, with no gating of the detector. So we have the, the transitions from the terbium, but we also have this broad fluorescence background for, uh, from the matrix. By using detector gating, the spectrum can be acquired only during the emission of the phosphorescence component. So the fluorescence background is removed and you get the spectrum of just the terbium component. And so gating can be used to separate the phosphorescence from the fluorescence. I now move on to the final section of my webinar, which is the on an application example of a TDF emitter. So characterization of these materials involves all the techniques that we just saw previously uh, put into action. So I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with organic light emitting diodes. They're now one of the most popular uh, display technologies for both mobile devices uh, and also television screens and indoor lighting. And there's extensive research into making these more efficient in both academia and industry. When electrons and holes recombine in an OLED, uh, due to spin statistics, 
75% of the excitons, electron hole pairs, are end up in the triplet state and only 25 in the singlet. So if we have an OLED that's based on a fluorescence process, this limits the maximum efficiency of the OLED to 25%. This is obviously not desirable, and so second generation OLEDs were made, which incorporated uh, heavy metals to promote inter-system crossing and uh, triplet transitions. So these second generation work through phosphorescence from the triplet state, but the downside is that there's no stable blue emitter, and they require the reduce the use of rare heavy metals to facilitate these transitions. And so there's a lot of research at the moment looking into third generation OLEDs, uh, which are based on thermally activated delayed fluorescence, which is this process what we saw earlier in the webinar of inter-system crossing followed by reverse inter-system crossing. And these have a maximum efficiency of 100% with no heavy metals required and there's the search for stable blue high efficiency emitters. The FLS 1000 is ideal for characterizing these TNF emitters. So all the examples here are this uh, CZDBA emitter uh, that we we got from a, through a collaboration. And the FLS 1000 can be used to characterize the photophysical properties of these emitters. So for simple uh, spectral measurements, the absorption and emission spectrum can be measured. And more importantly, the photoluminescence quantum yield can be measured using the FLS 1000. So the photoluminescence quantum yield tells you how efficient a emitter it is. It's the ratio of the number of photons absorbed to the number of photons emitted. And this is crucial for developing high efficiency OLEDs because the external quantum efficiency of the OLED is directly proportionable to the photoluminescence quantum yield. And the photoluminescence quantum yield can be measured using the integrating sphere accessory of the FLS 1000. And there's two options. We either have the standard sphere, which works at room temperature, and we also have a cryosphere for temperature dependent photoluminescence quantum yield from 77 to 500 Kelvin. In the integrating sphere, the sample is excited from either the monochromator or a laser. The sample emits uh, photoluminescence or scatters the light. And from the integrating both the photoluminescence and the scatter, the photoluminescence quantum yield can be determined. So for the CZDBA TDF emitter, we measured a photoluminescence quantum yield of 25% in a degassed solution and 13% in a non-degassed solution. Due to the reverse inter-system crossing process, TDF emitters have unique uh, temporal PL behavior, which makes time-resolved photoluminescence very powerful to study them. When a TDF emitter is excited, it's promoted from the singlet ground state to the single excited state, and it can then either undergo prompt fluorescence, which occurs on a nanosecond timescale, or undergo inter-system crossing 
followed by reverse intersystem crossing back to the single excited state with delayed fluorescence. And you get this by exponential behavior in the PL decays. So you have an initial fast component with a short lifetime, which is the prompt fluorescence and a longer lifetime component, which is the delayed fluorescence that is undergoing reverse intersystem crossing. So both uh, this decay was measured using an EPLC 375, and it was measured using the MCS mode in order to rapidly acquire the decay. One of the key pieces of information that the lifetime data can be used to tell you is the ratio of the quantum yield of the prompt and delayed component. So when you measure the quantum yield and in the integrating sphere, the total photoluminescence quantum yield is measured and you don't know how much of that is prompt and how much is delayed. However, by fitting the lifetime, you can calculate the ratio of the emission that's due to the prompt and the ratio it's due to the delayed. And then by applying these ratios to the total photoluminescence quantum yield, you can calculate that the prompt fluorescence has a quantum yield of 14% for this emitter, while the delayed fluorescence contributes 11% to the quantum yield to give a total of 25% PLQI. And so this is information that the lifetime data can be used to supplement the integrating sphere data. Another measurement that's very useful for the characterization of TDF emitters is to do a time resolved emission spectrum. So this is where the photoluminescence decay of the emitter is measured as a function of emission wavelength. So on the x-axis here, we have time, which is the time axis of the decay. On the y-axis is wavelength. And we can see this color plot showing how the decay varies as a function of wavelength. And to acquire these TRES spectra, measuring the decay using the EPL and MCS mode is a big advantage because these decays take quite a lot of time and MCS mode allows them to be acquired more rapidly. If we take a slice of this decay at 100 nanoseconds, we can look at the prompt fluorescence and four microseconds to look at the delayed fluorescence. And comparing these slices, we can see that they give identical spectra. And this confirms that we are looking at prompt and delayed fluorescence. So it shows that both uh, the microsecond and the, the nanosecond component originate from the same excited state because they have the same spectral shape. The FLS 1000 can be also fit with a cryostat to do temperature dependent photoluminescence. So as I mentioned earlier, there's this reverse intersystem crossing process where the population from the triplet is thermally assisted back to the singlet. And since this is a thermally assisted process, its efficiency varies with temperature. And so using a, a cryostat and the FLS 1000 
and it allows you to characterize this transition. Here are the photoluminescence decays measured at two different temperatures, 77 and 300. So we can see that the delayed fluorescence component at 300K is present, but when we go to 77 Kelvin, it ceases. Uh, and this is because the reverse intersystem crossing is turned off. And if we look at the phosphorescence, we can see the opposite behavior. At, at 300 Kelvin, there's no phosphorescence component because all the triplet population has been removed uh, through reverse sister system crossing back to the singlet. And so no phosphorescence occurs at 300. But when we cool the sample to 77 Kelvin, the reverse ester system crossing is turned off and we get phosphorescence emission. And so using an FLS 1000 equipped with a cryostat and doing lifetime measurements, you can investigate the dynamics and kinetics of this reverse ester system crossing transition. One final uh, important uh, parameter to measure in TADF research is the phosphorescence spectrum. So by measuring the spectrum of the fluorescence and phosphorescence, you can calculate the energy level splitting uh, between the singlet state and the triplet state. And by using a VPL laser and the gated PMT that we discussed earlier, we can measure the low temperature fluorescence and phosphorescence spectrum of the TDF emitter. So here is the photoluminescence decay of the emitter measured at 80 Kelvin. So we have really two components, the prompt fluorescence and a phosphorescence. And then we want to measure the spectrum of these two components. So we can use detector gating uh, as shown earlier. So if we set the gate delay to zero milliseconds with a width of 0 0.5, then we're going to be measuring predominantly the prompt fluorescence, which gives you the fluorescence spectrum of the sample shown in black. And if we then change the gate delay to five, milliseconds with a width of 50, we'll be measuring within the phosphorescence time scale, and you can measure the phosphorescence decay. And this allows you to fully characterize their matter. That brings me to the end of my talk today. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.